you believe we're on the eve of destruction? Welcome to the Patriots Lament Don't Saturday morning wake-up call right here on KFAR. It is a local talk radio, 660 on your AM dial, but streaming live around the world at KFAR660.com. And now the man who makes the show happen. Here's Aaron Bennett. Good morning, Aaron. Good morning, Steve. <coughs> Joshua isn't going to make it today. He uh, has three herniated discs in his lower back. and That does not sound fun. <laughs> no, he was planning on making it, and he couldn't even get out of bed this morning. <coughs> I'm kind of hoping maybe he calls in and maybe <laughs> joins us that way. Well, I'm, I'm sure that he'll uh, have something to say, whether by text or by phone. That's uh, one of the great things about this uh, show is that because we have so many different delivery systems there, it's uh, yeah, a way of uh, reaching people in ways that perhaps they never thought they could be reached. Uh, it's interesting, Aaron. I've, I've been hearing from more and more people lately how much this show, this Saturday morning experience, is affecting them and making them think about stuff that they really didn't want to think about so much easier in life to just go through and, you know, go get your free bread and go watch your circuses and pay no attention to the what the the Roman Senate is doing as Nero burns the city around us. I think when you take the, the effect out of the conversation, like, and go for the cause instead, or when you're not talking statistics or um, things of that nature... It, most arguments tend to fall back to statistics to prove who's the most rightest about the conversation at hand. And we just tend to stay away from those things and talk about principle rather than cause, effect, and things of that nature. And that's what seems to sway the mind the most when when you're able to take <clears throat> right, left, middle, libertarian, it doesn't really matter where you're coming from, when they all they all collectively support the state. I mean, even your your libertarian that likes it in his own mind to think that he's not supporting the state, but he'll still have his minarchist ideology of, well, how do we protect contracts or whatever his excuse may be for the use of force. It's still the use of force. Well, and it's still. I mean, if you if you're going to have government funded in any way, shape, or form except a voluntary donation, it's going to be theft. To sure. Get, to get people to to pay, I mean, it's just like a uh, if you a lot of people are familiar because they've seen movies of the mob and going and putting the muscle on local businesses and and saying you need to pay protection. Wouldn't it be a shame if something terrible happened to you if you didn't, you know? But we're we're here to protect you, so you pay your protection and nothing bad's going to happen to you. Well, people recognize that's theft. Sure. But isn't that exactly what the government does to us all the time? Right, and, but in our system um, in particular, you can't point to that and say, well, this guy's oppressing us. This, we don't have our Saddam Hussein to, to point to, so to speak, because we're all part of that participatory government, and that's where it gets most of its legitimacy from. In what? the freest nation in the world, supposedly, even though we rank number 10, you know we rank number 18 mm-hmm. if you purely go on economics. But we still tell ourselves we're the freest country in the world, and in the farce is because we can all participate. So anything that happens is legitimized. Well, I mean, you look at the issue, like for instance, bonding. If if we want to make, if we, the collective we, want to make an improvement on a local school, or we want to build a bridge, or we want to pave a road, all that costs money to do it. And so we take a vote, and we issue a bond, and then we have authorized the thug to go out and collect the money. Because we all voted. And if that one person out there decided, hey, I don't want to do that. I, I don't want to pay for it. Too bad. The rest of us voted for it. We're taking your money, too. All right. I guess <clears throat> I, here's a good example of why when people listen to this show, it tends to affect them differently than if they were listening to another show like Sean Hannity where he's talking about, here's what this guy did and here's what that guy did. So it's the end, end effect, right? So... If you, I was just arguing with a guy a couple of days ago. He was asking me um, what I thought about my brother Josh taking government contracts, right? Because he gets contracts on base and does work there for the federal government. And I could, obviously, he's bringing the argument to me from the the end effect of government. Government's taking money, building a facility for its own use, right? So I asked the guy. 
if he spends money? And he said, well, of course he does. And I said, well, isn't all money debt? And he said, well, yeah, in our system it is. So, so every time that you spend a single dollar, aren't you selling your kids down the river? Just the act of spending money is trading debt against your children. So where do you draw that line? So instead of looking at the end effect, look at the principle of the issue that you're talking about. And that can be applied to just about anything, but especially in politics. I'm trying to wrap my mind around what you just said, Aaron. The act of spending money is selling your children down the river. Sure. Isn't money debt? Well, I'm, it's... I mean, I've never thought of it that way. I've, I've always thought of money as the agreed-upon uh, system of exchange in, by which instead of having to carry around a bag full of apples to trade apples for oranges in terms of what are, are the things I, I want to get in my life, instead of having to barter for everything, I carry around Right, Steve, you're, you're or, talking about a, a free market decided medium of exchange. For for uh, an, uh, a medium to be of exchange would be money, right? Right, right. And for that for that value to be decided, the market itself decides it. Anything outside of the market deciding that would obviously cause inflation, right? If it's manipulated. Well, especially when you've got uh, what we're up to QE three now, right? With the, the Federal Reserve, saying right, We're just going to print more wait, money. You're doing what I'm talking about. You're talking about the end cause, right? The the mm-hmm. effect okay. of spending debt money. Who cares what the effect is? We can, we all see it, and we can talk about that statistic all day about how what the debt ceiling's done and things of that nature, right? But what is the real problem? The problem is we're spending debt money. Every time that you spend a dime, you're spending debt. So you're you're pushing the problem. All right. So assume for a moment that I that I grasp entirely what you're saying because. Of, I, mean, I think I'm almost there, but I'm not not, not quite. So I assume that I I do understand. Uh, what's the principle behind it? You said you, you said the show's the principle about principle. Principle behind is interest. I'm just kidding. Okay, now you now you're really <laughs> messing with my head. Uh, it, but if the what is the principle though? I mean, if you're talking about not wanting to sent, to sell our children down the river, not wanting to push the problem of debt off onto the children, how do you interact? How do you do business if you're not? Do you just not use Federal Reserve notes? No, I, <clears throat> I'm not talking about, um, all I'm talking about is you can't draw these moral lines where you say to yourself, I'm, I'm not going to cross this line, right? You can't say, well, when the government does this to me, then I'll have enough, right? It's just, it's the same mentality all the way down the line of even like our gun ownership. Okay, well we'll let the government do whatever they want to us with gun control, which no one can argue that because of the gun control bans that sunsetted. Just because they sunsetted, it seems like everybody's forgotten that they ever were. But we had massive gun control in America for a period of what nine years or whatever it was. And so people draw this new line saying, okay, well, if they come to take them, then we're going to get mad about it. So you can't draw these moral lines of what, you know, if you're in a system that's not right, then you can't draw these lines saying, well, this level of not right is the one that pushes me over the edge. Same thing with voting. Voting for the lesser of two evils. Or voting in the first place. All right, now we're, we're wrapping a whole bunch of issues together, and I understand that to a certain extent you can't really extricate all the issues from each other. I know they are intertwined. I mean, we're, we're dealing with a great big giant bundle of strings that's been tied into a huge knot. <clears throat> but just to, just to tug on the string a little bit more on the issue of spending money is selling your children in the future, is it, are, is you, it, are you only you're not? Are you talking about private individuals spending money? Or are you talking about yes. government spending? Yes. Is, is a Federal Reserve note a medium of exchange that's not forced? No, they force us to use it. They do not allow you. I mean, for, there was a guy where in Colorado that was printing silver coins, and they they arrested him for 
I don't know what the charge was, counterfeit or something. Because, and because of the inflationary um, way that they inject money into the market, they're essentially defacing the, the currency, right? Even though, even though uh, the paper money has no value, they deface their, they put a value on it that's forced, and then they deface that value, right? Because a very short amount of time of the, the first intern there when they first deface it, that injection of money, whoever it goes to, makes them pretty wealthy until it starts to trickle down into the market, and then everybody else's prices just adjust to accommodate for the in- inflation. No, that's something the government. So when you have been take that, when you for, take you that know. trickle down money and you spend it, you're inflating all the money around you, right? Which is raising the debt value of the money that you're trading. So every dollar you spend, every dime you spend of injected inflationary money, is selling your kids into further bondage. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm. I, I can grasp that, but what about the dollars that you already have? I mean, I, you go to work. Your boss gives you X amount of dollars for whatever it is that you've done for the day. If you don't go out and spend it, then if you hold on to it, it becomes less and less and less just by the very inflationary nature of what we were talking about. The money that, that you earn today is going to be worth less tomorrow because of the nature of the, the descending value of the dollar and prices rising and everything. So if you don't go out and spend it... If I'm, not, I'm not telling you not to go out and spend it. I'm just saying don't draw a moral line with me on debt money. Don't say, oh, well, debt money's okay unless you're doing this particular thing. So you're saying then it would be okay to have a government job because the government is paying you in debt money or do business with the government, whether they, they purchase your services. Is that what you're, is that what you're getting at? Yeah, I mean, I'm talking about the whole thing, the, everything as a whole. I was talking to a professor from the university yesterday at lunch, and he was telling me that government is required at the bare minimum to at least enforce contracts, okay? And he agreed with me that the the state is this and that. I mean, the, the typical thing that I would talk about here on the show or Josh would talk about. <clears throat> and he was a libertarian and considered himself a minarchist, it seemed, but he didn't use that phrase. He said a libertarian. But he believed that on the minimum, we needed to have government to enforce contracts. And then I asked him why, and he said, well, because if we didn't, people wouldn't abide by the contract, right? And I said, so in in essence, what you're saying is that contracts are unenforceable without the use of force, right? That's essentially what he's saying. And he said, well, sure, I, I guess that's what I'm saying. And I said, well, then you're saying that government should have the monopoly on that use of force. And he didn't really want to answer that question because he didn't want to cede that government should have a monopoly on the use of force. You can't be a minarchist. You can't sit there and say, well, we have to have this, we have to have X amount of government. We have to have X amount of expropriation. We've got to have X amount of theft and control and murder and the use of force. A minarchist is no different than a globalist that wants us to have a world government. There's absolutely no difference. There is no level of oppression. Um, Maria Renzo called the show one time, or not that long ago, and said that, well, by degrees, America's a way better place. You guys complain too much because there's places that are worse than here. She said, I admit that it's really bad here, but there's places that are worse. I don't agree that there's a a degree of oppression that I, I should appall. How much am I supposed to take, Steve? How much oppression am I supposed to deal with, quote unquote, before I say, okay, I wasn't meant to be ruled. I wasn't meant to be stolen from. I wasn't meant to be forced at the end of a gun. And you know, I think you just you just hit the core of the question right there. That that's what it all comes down to is that are are, are you or am I, or is anybody going to accept oppression at any level? To, to what degree? To, to, to what degree is it okay? It'd be, you know, you're talking about, well, this country isn't as bad as that country, and therefore we must be better. Uh, well, what's the difference between a prostitute that charges $25 and a prostitute who charges $25 million? One makes more money. It's the same person. I mean, it's the same profession, right? 
So I guess in that in that instance, you know, the the difference that you're talking about about a minarchist or a limited government person, most of the conservatives, so-called conservatives that we know that talk about how well government's a necessary evil, Aaron. We just want to have less government. We want to have less taxation. We want we want to bring it down by degrees. That's like that's like the prostitute who says, well, you know what? Uh, we're just going to we're not going to sell ourselves for quite as much. Right. It, it absolutely from a, from a principled standpoint, it makes no sense. You can't even retain principle and think like that. How is that even possible? I, I'm i a man of principles a little bit. I'm a man of, of fluid principles. I, I, only, I only accept murder of certain people. Right. It's like um, our government taking the... Uh, this mor- supposedly moral stance to not allow abortions in the third trimester. How many um, states have fought, the pro-life people have fought to keep abortions from happening in the third trimester? That's absurdity. So they're deciding, okay, well, the life starts around the third trimester, or is it because the baby's much more recognizable in the third trimester? Isn't that all it really is? Oh, yeah, a lot of it has to do, I mean, you can actually see definite, I mean, the, the human features of the baby begin far, far beyond, I mean, far, far before that. Yeah, but doesn't the woman look really pregnant? Oh, the woman looks really pregnant, yeah, by the third trimester. Mm-hmm. You can tell at that point if a pregnant woman goes into a clinic and comes out not pregnant that she killed her baby. Okay, let's say that I chew tobacco, right? And there's all these ads for anti-tobacco, and tell you about the things that they do. But isn't it a fact that if the destruction that's wreaked on my body from chewing tobacco showed up on the outside of my body, I would quit doing it? Yeah. It's the exact same mentality of why we allow abortion, except for in the third, third trimester. That's not principle. There's nothing in that that says, I have principles, I have morals, I know ethics. Things aren't relative. It's not relative to what you see. It, everything around you is not relative. You know, Josh has made a good point. If everything's relative, then why don't I just shoot you in the face? we got to get get out of this mentality that we can have these fluid principles. How often, I mean, you, you look at even just um, what happens in the schools. And I think that this is where an awful lot of the uh, the problems come from in terms of the everyday American. Because a child, you take a child, they, in, uh, I don't know how, but it seems like children in, in instinctively know, even as babies, that if you come and take something away from them, that's wrong. Sure they do. They They will cry if you just come and take out of their hand what it is that they that they have they will even um even fight each other right uh what drums that out of them so that they begin to think that it's okay isn't it the public isn't it the school system the indoctrination that happens when you're you're told again and again you have to share you have to share i think it starts with the parents That were indoctrinated by the same school. Okay, no, I was gonna, I was gonna, <laughs> uh, well, I, you know, part of it too isn't isn't a matter of just you have to share. I mean, like one of the things that we we teach our children is you can't take, you you can't just take from someone else. Sure. You you you. It is not right for you to just go up and take what he has. Right. I mean, that's valid. <clears throat> well, and, and it seems like now that, that it's been turned on its head, so that the person that gets taken from is scolded, no, you have to share. Sure. Instead of it being, hey, you that just took, you can't take. You know, it, it just, and I'm sure that there's more to that as well, but if a child in, instinctively knows that stealing is wrong, if a child instinctively knows that violence is wrong, and they, they may choose to do it anyway, you know, the human heart is absolutely unlimited in its, its ability to commit evil, even at a very young age. A child will, will, will certainly choose to hit another one, but they know what they're doing is wrong. Sure they do. The amazing thing to me is that um, when you talk about the absence of the state, people <clears throat> immediately fall back on, well, 
the problem with that is if we got rid of the state, people would automatically just start hurting each other and start killing each other. And that's such a farce. What what stops people from hurting each other and killing each other right now? Uh, it's because if I did, then I would be um, thrown in a cage? No. it's Right. That, in fact, it's the exact opposite. So if Steve's out to dinner with his wife and a gentleman walks up and publicly just lambast him, accosts him in front of all these people, calling his wife dirty names. Where would he get the security to do that, Steve? Because he knows there's not going to be any consequences. There isn't going to be any consequences because if you know there's a threat of the use of force because there's a monopoly on it. You're not allowed to use it. Mm -hmm. You're not allowed to do anything. The disrespect and contempt in our society is bred from this monopolized use of force of the state. People wouldn't be more, people wouldn't run around and just kill everybody. That's absolutely asinine. Government is the people anyway. <clears throat> but it's that threat of the use of force that breeds this contempt for anything that is natural. T take it to something that a lot of people, I think, would really, really take it to heart, is that the, the Second Amendment issue, carrying a gun. Because one of the arguments that you hear for taking guns away, the gun control advocates in places like Chicago, is that we have to get the guns off the street in order to prevent the violence. But what happens when they take the guns off the street is the only people who have the guns are the bad guys who don't care. All right. Whether, we could hit <clears throat> the statistics hard on that, but I well, think every, I mean, anybody that listens to this show is, already knows the t statistics that... Um, any place where they, the tighter the gun control, the worse the crime, and the exact opposite in places. And people can grasp that. The, and the more people who are armed, the more polite the society is. Right, but they, but people want to say, but without this monopolized use of force, which taking away our guns is the extreme of that exactly. use of force, exactly. right? Exactly. So they try and reason with themselves on these degrees. So there's this degree of use of force where that keeps everybody perfectly in line, but if it falls below this level, we all run out and kill each other. But if it goes above this level, then government's oppressive. Are you kidding me? That's what we just started the show with. There is this degree of oppression. If there wasn't this monopolized use of force, we'd be in a much politer society. It's like at a, at a certain dollar amount, you cease being a prostitute and start being a companion or something. I mean, sure. Uh, it's, it's just ridiculous. It, it, it is, it, to me, again, it's the same moral issue, and are, are we going to sell ourselves out to government? Uh, would what, what price would you put freedom at, Aaron? Do you, do you have, I mean, do is there a price? Could somebody come and pay you enough money to make you say, oh, okay, well, this level of oppression is okay. I accept that. Yeah, I'm being taken care of. No, but there is a level of uh, violence on the same note. Okay. That we all accept right now. Right? It's just like the commercial that's on um, the radio right now where they talk about you need to teach your children that driving is a privilege. Since when has driving been a privilege? Are we that messed up in the head that we want to teach our kids that they don't have a right to drive? It's a privilege granted to them by the state. That commercial is being played day in and day out, that you must teach your kids that driving is a privilege. How is driving a privilege? Well, you have to have a state-issued license well, sure. to drive. So mm -hmm. why don't you teach your kids that hunting is a, pr a privilege? Why don't you teach them that owning guns is a privilege? you guys realize that a privilege can be taken away? Absolutely. And that's what they're saying on the radio. They're saying you need to teach your kids that driving is a privilege. Well, it, because that, if they don't know, then they'll lose their license. It, but in that same regard, though, hunting is also a privilege in terms of the way our society is no, right I now. I understand. I understand. But it's a little bit more taboo to have a radio ad that says teach your children that hunting is a privilege because people think it's a right. People have come to the point where they accept that driving is no longer a right. Well, don't you think it's just a matter of time before they accept that hunting is only a privilege and not a right? Sure. Or that, what is it, voting? <clears throat> what are some of the other things that get people on? It's the same concept of saying, I'll let the government do whatever they want to my gun rights, which automatically makes them not rights, right? Mm -hmm. Until they cross this line where they come take them from me. So... You're willing to accept that driving is a privilege, 
you're not going to draw that principled moral line saying, okay, never mind, hunting is actually a right. Of course it's not. You accept that it's not a right as soon as you go get a hunting license. You're agreeing that it's a privilege granted by the state. And you grovel and you lick the hand that rules you. But if we didn't have hunting license, do you? People would go out and kill all the moose. <laughs> yes, they would. There would be there wouldn't be a single moose left out there for anyone. Because they would all walk into town and get shot. <laughs> Four five eight dog is the number of you that you're calling to participate in the program. Balanced. All right, welcome back to <laughs> Far North Tactical's Saturday morning wake up call. I'm Steve Floyd, the monkey behind the machine, joining me here in the studio from Far North Tactical. Aaron Bennett, good morning, Aaron. Good morning. All right, uh, would you like to open the phone lines? Sure. 458-TALK is the number of the lines are open. If you'd like to call in and uh, say something, ask a question, make a statement, uh, just kind of take a stick to the hornet's nest, whatever you want to do, that's what we're I think about. it's a good day for people to call in and bash on Josh because he has those oh, herniated discs and couldn't be- make it. Just because he's not here and can't defend himself on the air? Sure. And I'm, yeah, I'm hoping he's listening. That way um, he'll get to hear people go off on him. <laughs> I would encourage that. <laughs> Is Bass Josh Day? You're just, you're sick man. You are a sick man. I mean, can can we return for an instant, just for a moment to this issue of principles? Because where do the principles come from? Right now, it seems like our society, my 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 neighbors, my coworkers, the people on the street, do not seem to have a clear sense of what their own principles are. Isn't that really because they compromise them day in and day out? Perhaps. Maybe, maybe they never knew what their principles were in the first place, though. I mean, where did the principles come from? No, sure they did. I don't believe that. I believe that natural law spells it out for everybody. That's why I also don't believe people would run around and just shoot each other. That's absolutely asinine. You can't show anywhere where that where absence of the state has promoted that. And I had somebody yesterday try and tell me the Wild West. Anybody that's read a little bit in history realizes the Wild West was not very wild at all. In fact, it was pretty far from that. So I, I don't go for those arguments at all. You can't you can't show a time where the lesser government there was, the more um, uh, destruction and death there was. And if you think about it too, the the stories that were being circulated about the so-called Wild West, I it were I believe they were intentionally. Well, they, we know they were exaggerated. We know that they were published with the intent of getting people out and back on the East Coast to clamor for more regulation and more law and more imposition of government onto the so-called Wild West. I mean, you look at an awful lot of the, the, the seizures, the federal lands, the uh, you know, basically even the nationalized system of law that we have now as opposed to the federal system that we were founded under. You see, what people do, Steve, is I don't believe that people don't have uh, a bearing on their principles. You you see that in the voting and things of that nature. People's principles come out, what they're shooting for, and, right? So what I think the core of the problem is for Americans is they compromise so much on their principles that they'll sit back and they'll say, well... There's certain lines that if they get crossed, then I'm going to go ahead and stand up on the principles that I inherently believe right now. And see, the reason that we do that is because it's much easier to fight for your principles than to actually live them. So the gun issue is a good example of, well, when they come to get my guns, I'm going to do this and do that. But that placates you so you don't have to actually stand up for anything right now. Because there's this catalyst point where you're willing to fight for your principles that you don't actually believe in enough to stand up for them and live them. That's why you set up these boundaries all around you. If they start killing babies as they're being born, then I'm going to do this and that. So you have all these moral lines that you draw for yourself based on your principles. That if they get crossed, then you're going to do something. And that keeps you from having to live any of your principles. Excellent point. Would you like to take a phone call? Sure. 458-TALK is the number. Good morning, caller. Who's this? Uh, This is Ken. Ken, go ahead. Yeah, you know what? I got some bad news yesterday uh, from the so-called they, you know. 
you can keep referring to these people as they, when they come to get your guns, they do this, they do that. Well, they took away my, my, uh, PFD yesterday for hitchhiking home from Fred Myers with two bags of groceries. They put me in jail for eight days and they, they took me in front of they, they, the judge and the judge let me go and I said, is it all right if I hitchhike home? And he goes, yeah, it's all right. Just don't stand too close to the road. Anyway, so yesterday they took away my uh, PFD and they charged me with disorderly conduct because there was no, uh, there's no law against hitchhiking in Alaska and it was 50 degrees below zero and I had to get home with my groceries. And, uh, it didn't involve guns or anything like that, but, you know, it involved, you know, an infringement on my rights. They took $864 of my money, and I was planning on going to Seattle and getting out of here for the for the winter, you know. But anyway, so, anyway, that's my they story. Okay, let me ask you a question, though. Yeah. Who, who is they? The cops, the Fairbanks Police Department. Aren't those guys actually your neighbors? Yeah, well, they are, they, you know, supposedly. If I asked the guy, I said, how long have you been in Alaska? He goes, well, I just got here. I said, well, it's not against the law to hitchhike, man. And he goes, uh, he said, well, I'll just charge you with disorderly conduct. I said, whatever. Yeah. All right, I realize they can charge you with anything, but what I'm trying to say is we all want to refer to um, this government as they when in reality, we turn well, around. Well, I mean, who's they? Right, we turn around the next day and we go down and we vote for the best guy to get in. We, you know, especially on the local elections, we identify with the people getting in, and then we turn around and look at the oppression as they, when it's actually us. Yeah, it is. It's us. You know, it's the you know the guy might be my neighbor, the guy that put me in jail. Sure. You know. Well, even if he weren't literally your neighbor, it was your neighbor that gave him the authority to pick you up off the street and put you in a cage. Well, I, he doesn't have that authority. Well, sure he does, or you wouldn't have went to jail. Have you? Wait, wait. Have you voted? Well, I went to jail because I was hitchhiking home. Have you I mean, voted recently? I voted. All, I, yeah, I voted just about I don't know four then, weeks ago. Then you did give your your neighbor the authority to do that to you. Well, I went in front of Judge Ben Seekin. He was a pretty nice guy, and uh, you know he he looked at it and he goes, "This is a bunch of crap." You know? And I said, "Well, I just got to get out of jail, and I got to go home." <laughs> So I pled guilty. Right. So you got charged anyway. Thanks for the call. Good luck for you. 458-TALK is a number. Good morning. If you'd like to call in and participate in the show, the number is 458-TALK, 458-8255. Go back to that issue, um, Aaron, in terms of a, you said something that the cops can charge you with anything. Well, sure they can. And they got that authority from us as a collective to keep... Uh, keep everybody from running around shooting everybody, right? <laughs> so, if you went to um, the police academy, uh, any experienced guy there can tell you that you can, if there's any suspect that you want to pull over, all you have to do is follow them for about five minutes, and they'll break some laws that legitimize you being able to pull them over and get contact, right? Right. Because there's so many regulations on the books... That sure, they could pull you over for hitchhiking, and then he pointed out it's not a crime, so he just switches the crime. Because the crimes are actually perpetrated against the state. And once you have these non-victim crimes that are only per perpetrated against an entity who is the decider of those laws and the arbitrator in its own disputes and the ultimate decider of guilt... And has the monopoly on the violence and the use of force to enforce that. Right. Where is there any justice in that? So for, for a guy to call up and say, well, I was treated unjustly. Really? How could you expect any other outcome ever? There, there really is no justice at all because none of these laws are based, you talked about earlier, principle. None of these laws are based on principle. Well, none of these... if, if, if you can just arbitrarily make it against the law to hitchhike, or, or if that's not flying, well, we would just charge you for disorderly conduct. For what? For walking on the side of the road? 
Right. And where's the principle in that? What, who was hurt? It's called victimless crimes. If there's no victim, there is no crime. There's no injured party. So the state, to be able to regulate all aspects of your life, they have to set themselves up as an injured party because anyone with any kind of common sense realizes there's no violation without an injured party. Which is why they can pull you over for not wearing your seatbelt. Or right. why they can pull you over for texting while you're driving you if you haven't hurt anyone. But you have. You've hurt the state because they automatically insert themselves. And again, where does that lay come from? The people who wrote the laws, those are the people that we elect, and we send them down there and say, here, we give you the power to make up whatever rules right, you to want to, and we agree to Basically, you could rules. put it in a nutshell, Steve. If you have to create a law for it, then it's not a law because laws are natural. They're not some fluid, liquid thing, and we we can see it in every aspect of our life, right? Great great example of what's going on down in Anchorage right now with the sidewalk sitting ban. You remember that? Mm-mm. Back in November last last year, there was a protester who really got under the mayor's skin because he didn't like the way the mayor was treating the homeless people in Anchorage, so he started protesting against the mayor by sitting on the sidewalk out in front of City Hall. The mayor didn't like that. So he got the city council. He convinced them to pass a law to make it a crime to sit on, on the sidewalk. You cannot sit down on the sidewalk in Anchorage or lie down on it between the air, between the hours of 6 a.m. and midnight. I mean, that they were specifically saying that during any time that anybody else might want to use the sidewalk, we are not going to allow you to sit on the sidewalk or to lie down on it. They're taking right, away... And when, but when somebody actually violates that... Who's the injured party? No one. There is no injured party. Well, there has to be, or they wouldn't be able to push any charges. Nobody's actually been charged under it yet. It's just they're on the books waiting for people. Right, to, but somebody will be. Eventually. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about going down to Anchorage just to sit on the sidewalk. It will, be the, it will be the state versus. The state. The state versus Steve Floyd. Because sure. I dare to go down there and challenge their right to arbitrarily make a law out of thin air. Here, it gets more interesting, though, is that a couple of the assembly members had second thoughts. This week, just last Tuesday, they repealed the law. So what did the mayor do on Thursday? He vetoed the repeal. <laughs> I mean, where is the law? If you can create a law out of thin air and then repeal it and then veto the repeal... Do you know what the law is? How can you know what the law is? The law is pretty simple. It requires an injured party. And if you went and sat down on the sidewalk, you'd be issued a citation, the state versus Steve Floyd. That's how the guy walking down the road, the police officer that wasn't from Alaska for very long, didn't realize we didn't have a no hitchhiking law here, which a lot of states do. So... When he went to harass him, he's like, we don't have that kind of law here. So he just switched the charge because the state's the victim no matter what. But how can you know when you've offended the state, Aaron? It doesn't matter. They decide when you offend the state. Which means you can't know, which means that you are automatically pretty much guilty of anything. Which is great because anybody that goes to jail for anything, we automatically shun them. Yeah. In our minds. Yeah. Oh, he must have he must have done something wrong, or they wouldn't have arrested him. Sure. They wouldn't have put him in jail if he hadn't you, done something wrong. Do you wrong. think that that was the mentality of people watching what the Nazi regime was doing? Absolutely. Had to have been. Absolutely. I mean, I've, I've actually read um, some letters from people that had that talked about that very issue that they did not they did not allow themselves to realize what was going on around them. Because they were they were so intent upon being good citizens themselves, and and you know people were asking them later after the war how could you have been so blind as to allow this to happen, and like look we we didn't realize it because we were just trying to follow the law ourselves, we were just trying to be good citizens. If it we've talked in previous weeks about the issue of uh, that book, Whatever Happened to Justice. I'm finally reading it, by the way. It's been, uh, it's a Richard Mayberry book I've been reading. Um, Wait, which one? Whatever Happened to Justice. That's a good one. I, and as I've been reading through it, it's basically, it's really cool because it's uh, written as a series of le- letters and each one of them stands alone. So you can just, you know, read one letter. It's a little chapter, a couple of pages. And it really makes you think. And uh, I've been really, really digesting this issue of all law 
real law comes down to two issues. Do everything that you said you're going to do. That was the issue of upholding a contract that we mentioned earlier today. You don't Because you don't need a contract if you just do everything that you said you're going to do. Why would you have to sign a contract to try to bind you so that somebody can take you to court if you're not intending on breaking your contract? If you do everything you say you're going to do, you don't need a contract, right? And the second issue is don't encroach upon anybody else. And that's very broad. That means don't steal, don't take a man's wife, don't kill a man, don't punch a, punch a man in the face for no reason. I mean, all of that, don't encroach on somebody else's right. It all comes down to those two rules. I think I can catch that in my mind. I don't need to carry around a big book of laws to figure out if I'm breaking a law today. If I just do those two things, I should be clear, right? Should be. Should be. Right. But you're forgetting about the crimes against the state. Exactly. Because they're not based on principle. Right. Now, you could you could go through your whole life not encroaching on anybody's um, personal space and still commit erroneous crimes against the state from speeding to you name it. 458-TALK is the number. Good morning, caller. Welcome to the show. Who's this? Good morning. Hi, Cecily. Thanks for calling in. What's on your mind? Oh, quite a bit of listening to your stuff. But um, there's a natural law that happens in spite of all their uh, wrongdoings. It's karma. (laughs) What you do comes back around to you. And even those people who are pushing and bullying, their time will come. And and then as far as... um, the uh, people uh, in Israel, they're, they're, they were about to be sieged at Masada, where uh, um, instead of being slaves, they all took their own lives and uh, destroyed all their food in, any way, in order that they would not compromise their integrity as a people. They took themselves out rather than be slaves. Anyway, and those are a couple of uh, different possibilities. And uh, even marriage is a privilege as you need a license for it. But as you get that license, you sign your children over to the uh, government. Now they are property of the state. And uh, anyway, on and on. <laughs> God bless. Thank well, you. Cecily, thank you. Man. It's always fun when she calls in because she always says something that just makes you go, but- whoa. Uh, let's uh, think about the the Jews being besieged, killing themselves. I don't want to kill myself. What? I, I don't want... I... So, Natalie texted me a little bit ago, Natalie Howard. Ed, she had a good thought there. If we're willing to give the state a monopoly on the use of force, right, why don't we give them a monopoly on food and energy? We already have to a certain degree. I mean, you look They're at... They're not distrib- distributing it, though. Distributing it. Yeah, well... You, Try and go out and create a power plant. You can't. True. I mean, they're regulating it, yeah. but they're not. They're not. Um, and they're regulating they're, our food too. I mean, you look at all the rules with the Food and Drug Administration. It's a soft form of fascism okay. that we're in right now. Yeah. And I'm talking about obviously hardline fascism. Of course, I would make the argument. I would trash my own argument immediately and say that there is <laughs> there, there's no line to be drawn there. Of course, but yeah. just for the sake of um, thinking about it. If we gave them the monopoly on the food and on energy, they wouldn't need the use of force. But in the end, it would still be the use of force. Well, they, they just wouldn't need violence. Well, they, they, but they, I bet you they would, because if you ended up having state-distributed food centers, there are going to be some very selfish people who want more food than the government tells them they can have. <clears throat> and they might try to take more than their fair share. Or, you know what, would you look at look at all the times even in this country that we've had laws. I mean, like the food hoarding issue back in the uh, Second World War. Neighbors calling and ratting out neighbors. He's a food hoarder. <laughs> He's got too much food. <laughs> well, do you think that's coming again? Well, sure it is. They already have laws on the books that limit how much food you can have. Well, More than two weeks is considered um, hoarding. conspiracy. Yeah. If you, if you personally, right now in this country, if you got more than two weeks worth of food in your house, you are violating the law. You are violating the state. Right, because the the logic behind that is you're uh, conspiring to overthrow. But that's not logic. That is that right there is a conspiracy theory. 
That that is based on and it, it's appealing to the emotion of the ones who are being threatened by you, not depending on the state and depending on yourself. Right. Ron Paul um, has a speech where he brought it up in Congress and talked to all the congressmen about um, about the ridiculousness of having this law in the books where that limits your food. But if you think about it, in the event of a crisis. The control that the government would have, Steve, would be to be able to regulate food. Distribution of food would be ultimate control. So for you to hoard food is actually threatening to the state. It's very unpatriotic. Well, sure it is, because you could compromise their monopoly. Where, where do you want to go with the phones? We've got uh, three regular lines plus the hotline on hold. Uh, guys, hold on. We'll get to you all real quick. Uh, go ahead and take the hotline, I guess. All right, we'll go to the hotline first. And good morning, caller. Who's this? Hey, this is Josh. Hey, Mr. Bennett. How you? How's your back feeling? Well, we should have took you last because I was hoping <laughs> these other four were here to bash on you. <laughs> well, that's why I'm coming in because he's a free for all there. Um, I just want to say something because it goes along with what you're talking about, turning people in with uh, Nazi Germany and stuff. I don't know if Steve could Google real quick, but I read some story here and kind of followed up with it here this last week about people going to jail from their neighbors turning them in or not watching their children. So one instance was a gal, her two kids were playing in their cul-de-sac while she was watching them. She went in to make them a sandwich or something like that. Bang, here come the cops. She went to jail. Another instance was a lady had her kids playing in their own backyard they were climbing the tree, and their neighbor called them in. Bang, she went to jail. Child endangerment. That's, that's, here, that's, that's here in the United States, Josh. Yes. Yes. If you Google that up, anyone out there, there's several instances, and it's happening more and more and more. Your neighbors are turning in the neighbors simply for the fact of supposed child endangerment because the kid's outside playing. I, guess, I mean, he's not selling crack like he should be here. <laughs> Whatever. So you got to turn the people in. You know, Josh, I think that that is uh, there's something happening right now where I, I don't know if it's uh, like the ads that Aaron was talking about hearing on the radio or, where it's saying remind your children that the driving is a privilege. There's something going on because I the other day I, I saw a man riding in a an enclosed bulldozer with a child on his lap. And the, exactly that gasp that that's it, it it just like this little twinge of oh he's doing something wrong it's like wait a second what makes me think that what on earth would cause me to think that it would be wrong for a man to go out and have his son on his lap while he was working the state has made you think that anyway I just want to point out people are turning it's pretty big story right now from what I saw because I googled the one story and got m- many people we already turn each other in we're already a fascist state anywho <laughs> thanks for that cheery thought now I think I'm going to call and turn you in just for just for being unpatriotic and for being on the phone while you're driving yeah. all right four five eight talk is the number good morning caller who's this good morning how you doing today good who is this this is Kevin. Kevin, go ahead. Go, go quick. Okay. Well, one of the things that I was kind of bothered about is, you know, listen to all this as well, but um, these police seem to uh, decide what to charge and what not to charge. And, you know, my problem is, is they weren't willing to charge anything on my behalf and, and just allowed me to lose everything I own. But the thing is, is that their reason was, is they says, well, because you're not... You, you don't have as much at stake. You don't have as much to lose as this other guy. Well, I don't think people realize that I've pumped with all the with all the investing and and bringing in of investors. I don't think this town realizes that I have brought fifty million dollars into this into this town, and I'm not asking for a refund. Just a little respect. Yeah, but see, the thing is, is that the law enforcement officer, because of the power given to him, is actually the judge, the jury, and um, in many the whole cases, nine yards. in many cases, the executioner. Look at how many people have been shot by police here in Alaska just in the last year. Thanks for the call, Kevin. Four five eight dog is the number. This is Saturday morning wake up call. If you'd like to call in, we got about two minutes left for you to get your point across on the air. Uh, what would give a policeman the right 
to pick somebody up and make up a charge on the spot? Us. Us. By voting in people that they give authority in our name to whatever law they make up, because law is not hinged on principle anymore, because everything we've talked about this morning. 458 Talk, the number. Good morning. Who's this? Yeah, good morning, Frank Turney. I hope I got time. You know, no victim, no crime. Here's a good example. You remember the farmer in Minnesota was selling uh, raw milk to 130 members. Uh, he was charged with three misdemeanors. Uh, this was a victimless offense, selling unpasteurated milk without a license. Well, there was a victory. The jury found him not guilty during nullification oh, in really? Minnesota. Good. Uh, you can go to the Fully Informed Jury Association and read that. Uh, they applaud the jury's acquittal of Alvin and Shanklin in raw milk case. And there's another mal- raw milk case coming up in Wisconsin, and uh, the fully informed jury will be following that case. And I agreed with Aaron earlier. If there's no victim, there's no crime. The only victim is government. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. I appreciate that. I, I, Frank Turney has been a tireless <clears throat> uh, advocate of the idea of the fully informed jury because... If you go on jury, in fact, I'm, I'm knowing fewer and fewer people who actually get a chance to serve on juries lately. But if you go and you serve on a jury, one of the things that they instruct you now is that you do not have the right to judge the law. Right. They tell judge... you that you have to judge the facts <clears throat> as they are presented to you, which if you just even think about that comment, it's asinine. Well, and I, and I know of people that have been charged with crimes because they went and did a little research outside the courtroom. <clears throat> And they were they were charged with a crime because they they went and they added and they did research outside the courtroom. For Frank the case. Turney was charged with a similar crime. He was, but he also I mean he went so far as to tell his fellow jurors that they could they could in fact should judge the law. Right. So he was charged with uh, jury tampering. Jury tampering. <laughs> Think about that for just a minute. Where we do not have principles in this country at all anymore. Right. And honestly, all these people that want to change government, if they would just exercise their duty at the jury box, we could nullify and do away with 99% of these oppressive laws. And yet most people would do anything they can to get out of jury duty and then berate you for not going down to the ballot box. Or tell themselves that voting is going to do something. Yeah, You just vote in the right people and it'll all change. All right. We're coming up on the Fox News here at the top of the hour. And our next show, Patriots Lament, right here on KFAR 458 Talk is the number. Or you can join us in the chat room, KFAR660.com. The Saturday morning wake up call is a production of Far North Tactical, without which there would be no show. It's been a paid program right here on KFAR. 458 Talk is the number. Fox News coming your way right now. Hey, hey, this song is for us. This is the next show here on this Saturday morning. It's called (laughs) Patriots Lament. It is a program that is made possible by Bighorn Enterprises. They're the ones who dreamed up the show. They are the ones who uh, decided to convince the radio station to make it possible by giving the radio station some money. That's the way capitalism works. And uh, joining us now in the studio, um, back from the dead almost here, Josh Bennett. I understand that you are... In a lot of pain this morning. Yeah. And why did you decide to come in? I don't know. Because he was... Hang on a second. Man. What? Because he was, because Aaron was telling everybody to call in and bash on him. He wasn't here. <laughs> yeah. He got worried that people were going to take me up on no, it. Nobody actually did, though. So. I was kind of disappointed. That's because we didn't take calls fast enough. Well, I firmly believe it was going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> well, we can still do that now. The other voice you hear over there is Aaron Bennett from Porno Tactical. Gentlemen, um... We have had a couple of people call in since the top of the hour. If you'd like to take phone calls, we could also go off on whatever you want to talk about. Uh, personally, may I may I say something? Oh, uh, no. Yeah. Dang it. Well, which is it? It's divided. Let's take a vote. Let's flip the, my fruity snacks here. Heads or tails? Oh, uh, heads. Tails. <laughs> oh, okay. I guess I don't think you can say anything. Josh, where do you want to go to this hour? Uh, I wanted to mention something for, uh, I heard Frank calling just a little bit ago. Uh, New Hampshire, it's a very interesting deal. New Hampshire actually passed a law requiring, not necessarily requiring, allowing uh, defense attorneys to instruct the jury on jury nullification. And the judge cannot prevent him from doing that. So that's going to be pretty interesting. I saw that... uh, 
Well, the first case that I read about it, the only reason I knew about it is because, of course, some guy that was doing drugs was found not guilty. And I think, he, I don't know, several misdemeanor charges, felony charges, whatever, and the jury just flat out said, nope, not guilty. So we have a state which isn't the... Uh, are they live free or die in New Hampshire, or they don't try on me? I honestly don't know. I think they live free or die. Anyways. One of, isn't one of those Vermont? Hmm. Is that the green state? I don't know. Well, long story short, we talk, we hear a lot about uh, state nullification, right? Where you have uh, the state nullifying federal laws and blah, blah, blah. And it's a good principle, especially uh, go back and read the Kentucky and Virginia resolutions, what that was about, the... Uh, what the war of secession was the second war of secession was about state nullification but uh the more logical one the, the one that would really change i know we we've talked about this before the jury if we would let our vote always be not guilty we actually would change this country and it would happen I don't know how long it would take, but I don't think it would take very long at all. I mean, if we just went in there... New Hampshire is live free or die. Live free or die, right on. So, New Hampshire passed that law. Now defense attorneys get to tell the jury, you have the right to judge whether this law should apply or not. And they're smoking all, smoking them already. <laughs> not bulls. They're, mm-hmm. they're, they're taking, smoking them already. <laughs> they're, taking it to the, they're taking it to the state. The juries are finding people not guilty, and I think it's fantastic. Hopefully... Uh, I mean, it'd be really cool if Alaska would do something like that. I heard you guys talking about how now judges say, you know, and it's true, your job is just to uh, look at the facts and judge the law the way it's presented to you. I mean, apply the law the way it's presented to you, which is asinine. Why have a jury then? So I would hope that maybe, uh, well, I don't have a lot of hope in it, but it sure would be nice if, Alaska would do something like that. Or it'd be nice if we could just self educate ourselves and people would start finding not guilty in the first place. I mean, isn't that um, white people are so uh, vehement about voting, but at the same time don't want anything to do? They'll get out, try and get out of jury duty, which is basically another form of voting. I think they're intimidated partly. Uh, I isn't, don't, wouldn't you think it's more um, the whole principles concept I was talking about where it's way easier to um, fight for your principles and live them. If they're voting, then they're playing the warfare game of voting in somebody to force their views, right? So they don't actually have to do anything participatory in their own life outside of voting somebody to make those decisions for them. But in the jury box, they're having to actually play a proactive role. Look at the wood smoke. And stand, stand, they have to actually stand up on principle, not just uh, push it down the line. Look at the wood smoke issue as, a, as an example. On Tuesday, it's going to be on the ballot to basically bind the hands of the borough and not allow them to enact the ordinance which they've already voted for. Mm-hmm. There's already an ordinance on the rec, uh, uh, in the in the books. It will go into effect immediately, I believe, uh, the day after the election, if the people do not come out and reauthorize the uh, the last measure of basically saying, no, the borough cannot make such a law. Well, w- why do we need to do that if it's an unjust law in the first place? It's because most people will go ahead and bow down and lick the hand, even though they shouldn't have the right to tell you what you can or can't heat your house with. Right, right? It would be kind of cool if uh, they would just, if the measure would fail, they pass their law, well, it's already passed, and we burned our wood however we felt like anyways, and then we went to trial and we were found not guilty by a jury of our peers. That would be cool. Except that's not going to happen. Oh. Because what's going to happen instead is that people will start calling in and comp- and turning in their neighbors for burning for burning something that's not authorized. Here's, yeah. How, yeah, here's how far we've come. In, uh, I don't remember, I don't know exactly what year this is. I'm thinking 1786 or 7. Patrick Henry, the Bill of Rights of England, a subject in the Bill of Rights of England, subject has 
the right to trial by his peers. Now, what is meant by his peers? Again, this is Patrick Henry talking. Those who reside near him, his neighbors, and those who are acquainted with his character and his situation in life. This was during the adoption of the federal constitution. He was arguing about, he wanted a bill of rights with the trial by jury. And he goes on to say, why do we love this trial by jury? Because it prevents the hand of oppression from cutting you off. This gives me comfort that as long as I have existence, my neighbors will protect me. How far have we come? We were just talking a little bit ago where Patrick Henry is lauding trial by jury because he gets a jury by the by his peers, his neighbors, his friends, those that are well acquainted with him. That's literally what the trial by jury was about. And he's so excited about it or vehemently for it because... He knows that as long as he has that, his neighbors will protect him. If the, if the state drags him in, my neighbors will protect me. Right, now, here we are 200 the, years later, your neighbor's turning your butt in mm -hmm. and throwing you in jail. At the core of what he says is it doesn't it, – it's irrelevant how tyrannical government can get if you have um, the trial by jury of your peers. Which is one of the reasons why they tried Ted Stevens – in Washington, D.C. instead of in Alaska because they knew that they would not get a guilty verdict in Alaska. That's why they took uh, Schaefer Cox and that group down to Anchorage and not in Fairbanks. Schaefer should have been judged by people that knew him. His Absolutely. Friends, li literally. That's what the trial by jury is for. He should have been judged by people that knew him in his everyday life. The people that knew him the best should have been his jurors. That's the whole principle behind it, and we don't do that anymore. And it's pretty sad. I mean, it was the one, Jefferson was the one that said the one thing that can keep this government within the bounds of its constitution is trial by jury. We what else is there? There's nothing. Voting? Especially when we have uh, the kind of government that we have where we can, where we vote people in that have the right to make quote unquote law make up law make up laws of course you have to have a jury because they can make any law that they want to violate like the wood smoke issue oh. which is already on the books waiting for us to not tell them they can't <laughs> you, know, you, you hear people uh, well I have I've talked to several people and they that are against jury nullification the right of the jury because they say well then you'll just have lawlessness and we you know we're a people of Law and we we go. Our system is set by the rule of law and blah blah blah. But uh, the United States Supreme Court in the United States versus Doherty, they found that jury lawlessness. So they the Supreme Court even called it lawlessness. Jury lawlessness is the greatest corrective of law in its actual administration. So in other words, the jury by being lawless is actually the greatest way to correct law and its actual in the administration of it because they can say no you will not administrate that against this person doesn't an awful lot of it come down to the fact that most of the laws that we have now are not based on justice they're not based on principle they're not based on reason they're not based on what is right and wrong? Of they're course, just made of course up. they're not because they're legislated laws. Yeah, but um, if a law doesn't make sense, it shouldn't be a law, right? Well, if you have to create it in the first place. But what's funny is that a trial by a jury can nullify ridiculous laws, and we go to voting instead for that same. We're trying to do the exact same thing by voting. Same. We're trying to get the same results that we could get from the jury by oh, right. voting. Right. And exactly. it's it's the argument that people use. Well, you got to vote in self-defense. You got to vote in self-defense. But that's what the jury's for. That is the that is your self-defense. Should this person lose his home because he didn't pay his property well, tax? Not guilty. Right. Well, where where I wanted to take that was if I'm a, a juror in a trial. Let's say that um, Steve's on trial for. Um, Something ludicrous, where he's going to lose his home, whatever. And so I'm sitting there, and I realize that whatever law is made, whatever precedence is set, I should say, I'm setting my own precedence, right? Right. We've talked about that before. When you find someone not guilty on a jury, you're finding yourself not guilty. When exactly. you find someone so, guilty on a jury, you're finding yourself. When you're judging that law, you're judging the the 
how applicable it is to everyone, not not just to the person that's on trial. So you're definitely going to have the, there's a thousand times more justice in that. Where when you're do when you're taking the voting route, you're sitting back and not having to be active, right? Because it's not affecting you. So you're way more willing to take whatever injustice comes from the end result of your vote. Of somebody you put into office that arbitrarily decides what he's going to lay down on you, and you're way more willing to take that. Where at the jury box, justice would prevail because it directly affects you. Your decision is the outcome of what you have to live. Do you remember last year when the the Occupy Fairbanks people went over and set up a tent in that park and how? I remember those m- dirty people. How many people just get went out of their minds, calling for them to be forcibly removed from the park? And the question was, why? What have they done wrong? And then, well, nothing, but they're not allowed to do that. Well, who says they're not allowed? Well, I'm not allowed to do that. Okay? Right. Okay. Bingo. And, well, I can't do that. And they, these people just they went out of their minds, people that I know, people that I, I thought were good people that are just absolutely, they lost their mind wanting these people thrown in jail because they were standing up against an unjust law that this other person just was willing to submit to. There's a chicken out of the coop. There's exactly. a chicken out of the coop. You know, the hey, biggest, farmer, chicken out, chicken out, go get the chicken. The biggest argument that I heard for that was uh, they, if they want to change things, they should do it like everybody else and go vote. Mm-hmm. Right. Make your change at the ballot box. What a joke. Jo- oh, boy. I didn't even want to go down. Oh. <laughs> yeah, the did. will of the state at large imposed on a reluctant company on a reluctant community, the will of a majority imposed on a vigorous and determined minority, they find the same obstacles in the local jury that formerly confronted kings and ministers. Our duty is no diff- as a juror is no different than 500 years ago when you had tyrannical kings and jurors stood up to the kings and his ministers and said, not guilty, you will not take our friend and put him in jail. Who were you quoting just now? That was U.S. versus Doherty. Okay, again. the same case from before. Yeah, it's awesome. It's amazing. And Jefferson, the whole thing comes down to, I think, is the freedom of conscience. America was founded on the freedom, on the basis of freedom of conscience. You can go back. I've I've plugged this book before, conceived in liberty, and you can go back to when we first came over here, when uh, Europeans first came here. The biggest, the people that wanted liberty, the liberty was freedom of conscience. It was freedom of religion. Conscience to them was the freedom to worship, mm-hmm. not worship, do whatever. Freedom of conscience is essential to liberty in this country, and we don't allow that anymore. You can't be, even you can't have freedom. Even of conscience. some of them didn't allow it. You look at the Puritans who came here to, so that they could worship the way they wanted to, and they immediately turned around and enacted laws to make it illegal to worship not as a Puritan. They even killed people for it. Yeah, it. You know, one of the things, one of the reasons we don't have free, one of the, the drug laws, for instance, mm-hmm. freedom of conscience. Okay, if someone wants to take drugs, let them. They should be able to. But instead, we say, well, no, because they hurt themselves, they hurt other people, blah blah blah. You know, you can have a million reasons why we should have these drug laws, but it comes back to freedom of conscience. I'll bring up Thomas Jefferson. He said to, this was to Edward Douse in 1803. If you guys don't know who Thomas Jefferson is, then just turn the radio off. <laughs> Stop are, listening. We forbid it. We are bound, both you and I, and everyone, to make common cause, even with error, to maintain the common right of freedom of conscience. We should be fighting for the freedom of conscience. Right, and, and what, what's an not, error to me isn't necessarily an error to you. Right, but it doesn't matter. Well, right, freedom that's of what conscience, I'm, which, which is why we had the juries. Um, Adams was the one that said that, uh, John Adams, that the juror had the right to vote the way he wanted according to his own conscience. He had a freedom of conscience to say not guilty. So, folks, please, if you ever get on a jury, just say not guilty. Okay. Try it. It feels good. Flip it around for just a second. I mean, because you, you see an awful lot of these people that are so religiously dedicated to the idea of eradicating drugs, for instance, and, and we should make it illegal. Why? Well, because they're hurting themselves. No, not really. It's because they're doing something that you don't think that they should be doing. Flip it around. What if the law were mandatory drug use? 
Would you would you obey that law? No. The the government has passed a law. You must take your soma every single day. You must be medicated for the good of the for the good of the public. You must take your drugs. Would you obey that law? Nope. Wonder how many people that are for the drug laws though that would. Well, state state mm-hmm. said to do it, so <gasps> dang it, we have to obey the state rather than. Oh. Conscience? No, I mean, Conscience? you already know what the what the um, outcry would be. Yeah, if if it was uh, a placating drug they wanted to give to mm-hmm. everyone in America yep. to calm us all down, mm-hmm. it will lower crime. They'll have a million reasons why it's good. People would resist that, but the same people that are that would resist it like crazy would also enforce their will on other people. And, well, and and they would call up and report those who weren't taking their drugs. Well, how or about report people that were. The contraceptive mm-hmm. issue with uh, mm-hmm. Obamacare. Mm-hmm. How many people have come out and say, well, that's against my conscience. You can't. I have freedom of conscience. I, they don't actually use that term, but freedom of religion that's or what whatever. what they mean. You can't enforce that on me. Those same people, like Juan Hannity, I've heard him go mm-hmm. on and on about mm-hmm. it. But at the same time, he'll flip it over and say, but you, I will enforce my religious view yeah. on you. Well, and, and look at this for those who are... Keep telling me, and I, I'm, I've been told a million times how different Obama and Romney are. Romney's Massachusetts health plan did the very exact same thing and forced the Catholic providers to provide abortions. No, he's different, Steve. Well, he's actually um, a lot like George Washington. <laughs> In fact, I'm pretty sure after listening to Glenn Beck for the last week that Mitt Romney is actually George Washington reincarnated. Wow. You know what? I came to that same conclusion. I really do. Oh. Because how else could he be so amazing? I think somebody slipped something into in Glenn's uh, Kool-Aid a couple of weeks ago. Glenn Beck just absolutely went off the deep end in favor of Mitt Romney, which I, I mean, I'm i listening to him. I'm like, what the heck is this? But six months ago, he was vehemently yeah, exactly. supposedly against yeah. him and how horrible it would be. And now it's like, ah. how could I have been so blind? He, we all need to go out and vote for he, Mitt Romney. He's drawn a parallel of principles that put Mitt Romney and George Washington at the exact same level. That's just awesome. All right, we've got... he literally said that. Yeah, I... No, I... He literally said that Mitt Romney reminded him of George Washington. I was at the Carlson Center when Glenn Beck came to town. Were you? And said that. Oh, I got free tickets. I'm not going to turn down a free night He said that here. He said that here. Are you serious? Yes! How could I have been... I bet he is a lot like him, too, if we talk about the Whiskey Rebellion. I don't doubt that he wouldn't mind using federal troops against the people in a heartbeat. What I think is funny is if Mitt Romney gets in, is he going to do away with any of the implements that have been put in by the past four administrations that uh, promote the government's use of force? Oh, you mean like the Patriot Act? NDA? Oh, that's what keeps us safe. That's what keeps us safe. No, he's already set. He's on record. He'll use it. But not in a bad way. No, he won't we can abuse trust, his power. We can trust him because he's not Obama. Nobody abuses power. No. No. Not Americans. No. All right. Gentlemen, we've got all yeah, four lines on hold. 458-TALK is the number. Some of them have been here since the beginning of the hour. Good morning. Who's this? Yeah, good morning. This is Frank again. Hey, Frank. I don't know if i got time. You're going into the news hour. Right? we got we got a minute. Go ahead. Uh, well... Uh, you know, I heard Josh earlier mention conscience. Well, I've heard Fairbanks judge right here in Fairbanks tell jurors to leave their conscience at the courthouse door, at the door, and just look at the facts. Well, I told the judge later in the hallway, well, why don't you just get 12 computers up there? They can compile facts, judge. Yeah. You know, jurors have a moral obligation to vote their conscience. They have wisdom and experience. Also, New Hampshire Governor John Lynch signed HB 146 in June 18th. It'll come effect uh, in January, but here it is. A right of the accused in all criminal proceedings, the court shall permit the defense to inform the jury of its right to judge the facts and application of the law in relation to the fact it controversy. Now, here in Fairbanks, judges forbid defense attorneys from informing jurors that they have a right to nullify the law. They can be fined or disbarred. 
And it's too bad that we don't have actual good defense lawyers will stand up to these corrupt judges here in Fairbanks. But uh, this is interesting. Uh, Elio Jones said New Hampshire law will end up having a tremendous effect on the American judicial system as a whole. If people start nullifying these drug laws when there's no victim, there's no crime. Hey, not and there's just a drug, lot more not just drug laws, any law. And I appreciate you talking about uh, Governor John Lynch. Uh, he signed proclamations in New Hampshire for two or three years, right, recognizing the power of the jury. And I just want to let people know that our mayor, Jerry Cleveland, was the first uh, city councilman in the state to introduce a resolution supporting jury nullification. And when he became mayor, this is the second year in a row that he recognized and signed a proclamation regarding the jury to judge the laws as well as the, the facts. So we got a stand-up mayor here when it comes to juries. Thank you. All right, appreciate the call, Frank. we got uh, about a minute left before the news. want to try to squeeze in sure. another call. We have to go fast. Good morning, caller. Who's this? Hi, this is Tim. Tim, go fast. Uh, it's not a fast one. Uh, <clears throat> Republican luncheon, Luke Hopkins, he hid behind all the stuff that pisses everybody off uh, around here as the law. I'm just uh, enforcing the law. Well, I'm sorry, I know where this stuff comes from. It's not, quote-unquote, the law. It's five people agreeing to inflict and do something on all the different people that basically he's put forward uh, as the administration to want to be done to the people in the first place. So when you get these people hiding behind the law, it really irks the heck out of me. But who put those five, who put those people in charge, Tim? Uh, the special interest group. Didn't, didn't you vote? I certainly didn't vote for that. Welcome back to Patriots Lament right here on KFAR. You know, at the beginning of the show, I, I had wanted to say something, and I I asked uh, if I could, and we, we suggested instead we take a vote, and Josh flipped a, a fruit snacks and said head or tails, and I, I agreed to participate by saying heads, and that... We never actually defined which would be heads and which would be tails. <laughs> well, where oh, it says, come on. That's no, so no, no, no. Hang on, hang on. Hang on a second. I mean, where it says does fruity it, snacks, that's obviously heads. And where the ingredients and warnings. Does it matter? No. You should I have just agree, asserted your right to I agreed to participate, and I surrendered my right to speak my mind to you. Well, you did lose the vote. Exactly. By participating in the vote, I surrendered my rights. I'm beginning to understand now. Well, the beautiful thing is is that you put them up for compromise in the first place. So they were never rights anyway. By the fact that I asked for permission to speak my mind. You guys want any of these fruity snacks? I do. No. All right, you guys ready this to go back to the... my hunting jacket. It's full of goodies still. <laughs> yeah, he's ready to go back to the somebody. phones, or you want to go someplace else? Israel wanted to... All right, Israel, get back on the mic. Oh, I know it. Okay, so I know what you guys are thinking, what? but I was listening to Glenn Beck a couple weeks ago. I, I think it was Glenn Beck, if I remember right. And he was talking about some trivia vote that whoever put on, prob- most likely the government about different questions about Mitt Romney and Obama. And so he was just going on about how sad it was that only 35% of the people that voted only got the question right and the rest got the question wrong. And he was saying how how it was so sad that uh, they always target the stupid people that they always uh, put out the weak people and target them. And I said, well, well, Dad, why is he voting for him then? <laughs> and uh, then I thought, well, most people uh, refer to the government as they. They, as in plural, a whole bunch of people, right? So... Why do they keep changing out people when they are still there? They they vote in Mitt Romney, but Mitt Romney's only one person, and they are still there. I believe Does that's that make the, sense? The impersonal they day. They are always there. The it's, impersonal day. It means that I don't have take I I don't have to take responsibility for my actions. It they did this. You know, they say. All right, if we stru- if we restructure they to be more in line with what we want to force on everybody, 
then that's called legitimate. And uh, then it's and then it's we. Ain't me. Hmm. Hmm. This huh. is about voting is stupid, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> um, voting is stupid, is that what you is. Said? What kind of an American because are if, you? Because if you vote in Mitt Romney, okay, we got Mitt Romney in there now, but they are still there. They are still taking your money. Especially when you talk about bureaucracy. They never change. They never change. They are still there. I want to ask a real quick question. Tim brought up Luke Hopkins. I heard a commercial. Can we, can we vote about whether or not you guys should ask that question? It was a dictator's fit. Oh, you ate the fruity snacks. We don't have anything to flip. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he brought up Luke Hopkins. I heard a commercial on this radio station from Norm Phillips. And... One of the things that he said on there kind of disturbed me. Um, he said, "When if I was mayor or when I'm mayor, um, Occupy won't happen on my watch. And I was really curious about what he meant about that. I don't know. I doubt he listens to the show, but if he called and or any of his surrogates, I really want to know, what does he mean by Occupy won't happen under my watch? Does that mean... People won't protest under his watch without his permission, or only people of his persuasion will be able to protest. Or you know, one of our coworkers here at the radio station, who happens to be in another studio right now, Rob Yost. He's been on the program in the past. He mm -hmm. actually is serving a suspension right now from being on the air because he used a bad word uh, a few weeks ago. But one of the things that he pointed out is that if you think you have a right to go out and use a park without permission. You can test it for yourself. All you need to do is go to any park in Fairbanks today and lie down on the grass. If you look respectable enough, they'll probably leave you alone. But if you go out there and you lie down, just take with you a bottle of Sprite or a Coke or something, put a bottle in a, pla in a brown paper bag, open, put it next to you and lie on the grass. You will be picked up out of that park. I see some nice green grass across the river You will be picked here. up out of that park. Very, that's Maybe not a park. A no, no, that's not a park. Right across there, that's the borough building. What? That green space, you can't use for anything. That's private property of the state. Man. Yeah, you have to be government to use it. Oh, we're government. Oh, never mind. No, we, we, we are they. All right. They are we. I'm confused. 458 Talk is the number. Did you want to go to the phones? Good morning, caller. Who's this? Yeah, this is, well, let me pinch myself. Oh, it's Georgie. Georgie, Georgie, go ahead. What's on your mind? Well, I heard you say that you were at the Carlson Center when this guy was up here speaking. I even forget his name now. <laughs> was there, am I $70 dumber or $70 smarter? Was it full? Was the Carlson Center full when this guy was here speaking? Um, I can't even remember his name now. No, it was ridiculously empty, actually, when Glenn Beck was here. It oh, was, really? Yeah, the, the floor... Had uh, quite a few people on it, but in terms of the the first level around the floor, had a spattering of people, and there was like nobody in the top levels at all. How many people does the Carlson Center hold? Does it hold 5,000? Probably that. So Probably somewhere in if there. if he was lucky, he may have been at 500. Oh, wonderful! I'm seventy dollars smarter than. Thank you. <laughs> you're, wel <laughs> you're welcome. Our four awesome. five eight dog is a number. Good morning. <laughs> this is Patriots Lament. Who's on our phone? Hello. If you're there, say something. All right, moving yes. on. Good morning. Who's this? Hi, is this me? It might be. Depends on who it is. Hi, Steve. This is Scott Calder. How are you doing? Hi, Scott. Good. What's on your mind? Well, you know, this voting thing, um, there's there's something called a blank vote. And, you know, if people wanted to say that they disagreed with the validity of the choices on the ballot, then what they could do is they could go cast a blank vote or a blank ballot, for that matter, if you didn't want to make any of the choices. And then at least that way, there would be a, a, a record and a report of the number of people who voted that the choices were not valid. If you just stay home and don't do anything, then it's just a bunch of talk anyway. I don't think so, because the, uh, I mean, don't we know the percentages of people that don't vote every single year? Mm -hmm. So they are counted. Yeah, they are counted. And, in fact, if you go and you and you vote blank, I was thinking about this the other day, 
about I, I wanted to do a protest vote, and I'm thinking, well, what if I go in and write in Mickey Mouse? I understand that uh, every single year, Mickey Mouse on the national level gets millions of votes. Every, but he never he never wins. Uh, and I, I don't know if he has a better chance than Ron Paul in terms of if, if, if I were to go out and write in Mickey Mouse. However, I was asking myself this question. What is the point of doing so? At the bottom line, I'm still going to be counted among all of the great maj- m- m- vast number of people who voted, and the c- outcome is not going to change. Yeah, but unless you're Lisa Murkowski, the write-in votes aren't counted, but the blank votes are counted and reported. I mean, well, I wonder a, if Ron Paul can... report on how many, you know, write-in votes there but, are, but, but you don't know who the write-in votes are but for. But to what, to what extent? I mean, even if they count the blank votes, the blank never wins. You never end up with nobody filling the office. Yeah, but it would be an overt act that would demonstrate a choice on the part of a group of individuals. They would just count it as more people voted. Exactly. I mean, you're you're still playing their game. Ron Paul needs to figure out a way, like Lisa Murkowski did, to count votes that aren't spelled exactly like his name. So he should say (laughs) that Mickey Mouse is another way to say his name, and he'll win. No, I think that's a good idea. Yeah, but if the blank vote were to double or triple or began approaching a proportion that was near to the other specific choices that are provided, then I mean, I think you mean like the fact that seventy-five percent of the people stay home every Pardon? single year? Right now, right now, we only have one in four people who vote. Don't you think that seventy-five percent is a pretty strong mandate of saying you're not doing it right? Yeah, but if you show up and say that that's what you believe rather than not showing up, then you eliminate all the arguments about, oh, people are lazy or apathetic or they don't know what they're doing. Or no, the basically you're arguing for them to count it as legitimacy. Because if you show up and you vote nothing, if you if you put in a blank, then what you get called is stupid. Look no, at, what you get is called, well, they just didn't like the choices. They still advocate for the system as it is. It right. Just, this, whole, legitimacy. this conversation misses the whole point. It has nothing to do with whether we have a good choice, A or B. It has to do with this system, this state is illegitimate. Not that a, not that the Democrat didn't give me a good guy to vote for, not that the Republicans gave me a good guy to v- vote for. The point is, I'm not voting because it's a sick institution it's an illegitimate institution the state is illegitimate it has no right to rule over me i am not going to participate in its so-called election i'm not going to give it my consent by going down and saying i don't care who i vote for i'm not going to participate in what they want me to do they want me to go vote no matter what i mean you listen to commercials they say mm-hmm. just vote it doesn't just as long it as it doesn't you vote, matter who you vote for as long they as you turn out to vote need you to vote because your vote is their consent. When you remove your consent, if we all removed our consent, they would be illegitimate because we're supposedly governed by consent. I don't give my consent. People um, People keep trying to guilt me into voting by saying that because I served in the armed forces, I have a duty to vote. That and and if that doesn't work, they say, well, other people fought and died so that you would have the right to vote. And I ask you. And I asked this question earlier in the week in uh, the other show. What am I holding in my hand right here, Josh? Uh, constitution. Pocket Constitution. All right. It's, on there. it's got other essential uh, documents in there as well, like the uh, Declaration. Declaration of Independence. Where in any of this does it give me the right to vote? It doesn't. Or which, the duty. Which amendment do, does, do I have the duty to? Uh, it, it, the closest thing no is... No right, no duty. It doesn't say anything about it. Isn't uh, the closest thing the jury... Yep. yep. You look at uh, something like MTV's yep. Rock the Vote, which is huge. I mean, the MTV crowd that watches that is huge. And they they even had Ron Paul on there. They're not biased. I mean, you would think that they would be biased, but they try and keep it very unbiased. Well, but Ron Paul's a rocker, too, man. Well, sure. But their whole, their whole premise is to rock the vote. And they tell... They're trying to outreach to the youth to tell them to get out there and vote. They don't tell them to vote for anyone in particular. They, the important thing is just to vote. Mm-hmm. The important thing is just to get enough people to lend legitimacy to the state so they can say, we are governing you by your consent. Which is one of the reasons they've had to lower the voting age over and over and over again. Which is why they had to open it up to people besides just uh, property owners. They've had to make it easier and more open and get more people available to vote because their legitimacy is always knocked down, knocked down, knocked down. I mean, 
if we can say that 25% of the people voting right now lends them legitimacy, they do, obviously. So Well, and they count it, it, they count it as a mandate. 2%. Yeah. If you get 51% of the people who turned out to vote to vote for you, so 12% what kind of, of a people? joke is that? Well, look, say some, I want to say something about the uh, 501c3 thing, which is great. You have um, churches all around the nation. They're going to have a 501c3 free day. I believe it was Glenn Beck that was talking about it. They're going to have one day where they talk to their congregations about who they should vote for. Republicans. Mm. All right. Who do you think they're going to tell everybody to vote for? Well, there are an awful lot of churches that tell people who to vote for regardless of that. They don't care. I mean, most of them, and you, you always hear them criticized as the liberal churches telling people to go out and vote for Obama or telling people to stand up for the rights of the um, I mean the social justice movement that that really and what happens with those churches is nothing yep well the point of just to reiterate because people don't seem to understand has nothing to do with a bad choice it has nothing to do with well I'm not going to vote because I'm frustrated and it doesn't do any good it has everything to do with the state is illegitimate. Anything, anyone that wants to rule over you and govern you, in my opinion, is illegitimate. I do not give my consent to that. They can force me. I'm not going to play along with their game. They can force me. But I'm not going to do what they tell me to do when it's something I can easily not do. Like I said, they can come shoot me in the head. That's fine. But I'm not going to give them my consent to shoot me in the head. I'm not going to give them my consent to shoot my neighbor in the head. I'm not going to give an illegitimate state the right, the consent, to go and kill my neighbor. You're sounding an awful lot like Patrick Henry right now, that whole give me liberty or give me death thing. I mean, you know, that that speech, the give me liberty or give me death, actually was spurned from, what town? I think he went into Philadelphia... I don't want to, I'll probably mess this story up. He went into, I think it was Philadelphia, he went into, and there was a pastor, preacher, who was in the stocks. And the stocks were, you know, this big block of wood, and you had your arms through it, and your neck through it. For the whole town to see. For the whole town to see, to show the whole town obey. And he was in there, in the stocks, this pastor was, because he refused to get a license to preach. Right, the state was issuing licenses for people to preach. He would not get a 501c3 license, basically, even though they didn't have that particular one at the time. He refused to get a license, and he preached outside of the uh, the Anglican, the Anglican view, or whatever. Patrick Henry came into town and saw that, and he was horrified by it. And that is actually what that speech was spurned from he originally that's why he was like give me liberty or give me death right, he, why do we have a pastor because he doesn't have a license from the state he what he said was is is if this is if this is freedom if being an englishman grants us rights and if this is what we call liberty then i don't want anything to do with it if this is what we call freedom is what he said if this is freedom i don't want anything to do with it i want liberty give me liberty or give me death and that set the precedence for the speech that he made in front of um, Virginia. Virginia House of Commons. Virginia House of Commons, yeah. 458 Talk, okay, the I'll number. Good morning, caller. This is Patriots Lament, and we cleared the lines. Yeah, history's boring. People don't want to hear it. You know, they would much rather watch football. And we- isn't it good? <laughs> isn't it so good that with everything else that's happening in the world, we have the regular NFL refs back? Oh, yeah. I mean, thank it was God. Important. It was important that, enough for every, even like Josh was saying, Obama to talk about. Obama, Paul Ryan. We we talked about that in the break. We didn't talk about that on the air. I mean, this is this is like ancient Rome, man. We're more concerned about what's going on in the Colosseum than we are about what's going on in the Senate and with the public treasury being raided. Where is Patrick Henry? You know, I watched the Beverly Hillbillies when I was a kid, and I remember Granny one time. She was she was. Uh, there's a bunch of Indians <laughs> circling their mansion. She was shooting them with her rifle. And they were, I mean, they were just, it was a made-up thing. But she thought it was real. So she's shooting. She's like, where's John Wayne when you need him? And at the end of the show, he actually showed up. And But anyways, where's Patrick Henry when you need him? I think he uh, he got death instead of liberty. I think they voted him out. <laughs> <laughs> 
He's too he's too controversial. You wouldn't want somebody he was like actually that. Wanted. He didn't like his foreign policy. <laughs> Oh, an, wasn't he an isolationist? He didn't want to sit down on metal. Well, he definitely movie. didn't want to kill brown people, which is just odd. Let's <laughs> let's let's do take Glenn Beck's advice and we'll all say it together. Islamo fascists. Mm. Are we gonna say it together? Oh, no. Oh, okay. No. Islamo fascists. Oh well. Yeah. Oh, well. Okay. Let's so take we a call. That fell apart. Four five eight talk is the number. Good morning, caller. Who's this? Uh, Gloria. Hey, Gloria. What's on your mind? Well, I'm calling in answer to what your question about Norm Phillips. Oh, thank uh, you. I heard him talk about that, and he said. I think it was more in in relation to the uh, Veterans Park. He said that should be to honor the veterans and and that kind of exposure uh, to what they were doing was just not uh, you know honorable for the veterans. That should be to honor the veterans. Gloria, do you think that the veterans would be better honored by uh, us allowing people the freedom to do that? Well, uh, different, you know, you, you could word it differently, and everybody's uh, uh, concept, you know, would be a little bit, could be a little bit different. Well, well, is, you... Isn't it pretty um, straightforward? They either have the the freedom to do that or they don't. So what is it that it, that we're trying to glorify with the troops in the first well, place? Is the... that they went and fought and died for liberties, right? How is that any different than Patrick Henry being... Um, um, all sore and bent up about a man having to be put in the stocks because he didn't get a license. Just, so essentially, if that's freedom, then he doesn't want any of it. He'd rather have liberty. Well, uh, it, it just depends on how what you think of as respect for the well, property. Gloria, the, 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 the veterans themselves turned out in favor of the Occupy Wall Street Some of people. them did. Most Maybe of them did, of them Gloria. Didn't. Most of them did. I'm, you, I'm you a can't. veteran, and uh, I didn't show up. I mean, I didn't show up because I just wasn't involved. I didn't want to get involved in that. But um, you know, there are a lot of veterans out here that could or couldn't, you know, might not have, or might have. But uh, it, it just depends on your concept of what the respect should be shown to yeah, that there's particular def- piece of property or not. It's definitely a. Uh, I guess a sticky subject because of the veterans and this and that. I mean, because that's what that park was put there for. But if we take it down to its roots, what do we we always talk about when we have a war? They fought for your liberty. They fought for your freedom. They fought for your freedom. You are free to speak today because someone went and shed his blood for you. Part of that freedom is the freedom to protest the government. What? Why wouldn't that be part of why those people fought and died? Well, that's one concept. I mean, you know. I mean, right. How wh- how could you equate it as freedom to say that what well, they went and fought and died for the um, state's freedom to assert whatever they want over you? Well, it, sometimes the, the people that do things like that leave everything sloppy and messy, and uh, you know, it just it is just not the right. It may not, you know. Uh, demonstrating, but the way they did it, it might have been, you know, not Gloria, acceptable. Gloria, you, you just brought in something that completely did not happen. The Occupy Wall Street people that were over there at the Fairbanks Veterans Memorial Park were very neat. They didn't leave any mess at all. I mean, you're 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 grasping at straws. The fact well, of the that, matter is, is that you didn't agree with them, so you didn't want them to speak, isn't it? No, that that's not. No, that's not my freedom of speech position. for me, I'm but not, not for you, right? <laughs> Anyway, we appreciate you calling in and letting us know what the what his context was. Yes, thank that's you. That's mostly what I was wondering about. Well, and that to me is even more. Con- I mean, that's a, that's more troubling to me. Well, you know, Jefferson was the one that said uh, he liked a little bit of uh, the word he used wasn't protest, rebellion. Yeah, he liked a little bit of rebellion, even when wrong. Even when wrong. Yep. Four because five. it keeps it keeps that stirred up in you. I mean. And what we have instead is complacency. That's what he was afraid of. We'd get complicit in our day-to-day lives and allow something like that borough building over there to be erected and put over us. You just said complicit instead of complacent. Complacent. But you know what? You are right because we are complicit as well. We participate, we give them the right, and then we turn in our neighbors. Again, going back to this Occupy Wall Street. Look at how many people were clamoring, throw those dirty hippies in jail. They weren't dirty. They were college students. They weren't hippies. In fact, most of them ended up being, I mean, after we, we talked with them, uh, well, we had like three or four of them in here, didn't we? Yeah. 
I mean, they were well-read, capitalist, anarchist, not violent. I, I mean, very reasonable people. Yeah, they were reasonable. They were a lot more reasonable than the people that want them thrown in jail, I thought. I but, thought so, too. Anyways, we got... 458 talk is the, the number. Good morning, sure. caller. This is Patriots Lament. Who's this? Hello. Hey, who is this? What's me again? Oh, hi, Cecily. What's on your mind? Oh, it was the the idea that you are a magnet to to uh, what you you bring to you what you hold in your mind and so those things the the thing is, is i never did get the occupy uh wall street message except for that they wanted better treatment if they were had to be slaves that's what i got from it but and and the thing is it's nice to to know what you're pro, you know what you're protesting what's your message and and it seemed to not be poignant at, at all but except for you know, get off our backs kind of thing and well, let us... Uh, they were uh, mad about bankers basically getting bailed out, which I was mad about that too. But oh, yeah. Their message maybe wasn't... I don't know, maybe it was a little bit misconstrued or whatever, but the point that we took was that they were protesting. Good. Protest. And, and yeah. who, ca- who cares what their message is? Yes, protest. If, they, if their message is wrong, if it has a level playing field... It will lose. Yeah, I had no problem with the, with with protest in any sense of of, of it, be, uh, just because uh, you know it, it, sometimes we have to push back the bullies and let them understand that we that they have to watch their their uh, over uh, zealous uh, power trip. And we should be, always be, go ahead. Right, we're all missing the the concept. The same thing we're talking about with the jury is. If we don't support Occupy Wall Street guys' um, right to protest, then we're basically selling our own. Right. I yeah. don't have the right. Right. I don't have the right. They don't have the right. Nobody has the right. But Gary Cleaworth has the right to go in and steal all your treasures from your house. <laughs> all right. Thanks, Cecily. 458 no, Dog is the number. The We've got uh, less than a minute. Go quickly. Who's this? Are you there? Yes, this is Ben. Ben, go quickly. Yes, you know, I'm glad you guys are finally drinking your coffee and waking up, you know. It's all about contract. Uh, there, there is no legitimate seat of government. Um, you know, they don't, uh, we give them as much authority, uh, as much authority as we give them, you know. Uh, come on, wake up and smell the coffee. We're, <laughs> we're the ones that give them the authority. Yeah. We're the we're, ones that, yeah. We've been saying that for a couple of and every time, every time you turn out to vote, you're giving them more the, the legitimacy, right? For Twenty years. That, I've been that's, saying that. that's one reason I don't vote. Oh, right on. Oh, there you go. Well, that's a good reason. <laughs> <laughs> I'll listen to you guys off the air. All right, you know what? We are out of time. As a matter of fact, oh, as, as far as all that goes, uh, thanks Over for being already. here. Uh, contact information, Josh. Uh, PatriotsLament.blogspot.com or uh, Radio Free Fairbanks on YouTube. You guys can email us at. Uh, what is it? I don't even know what the... Patriots Lament at Gmail. Right. Com. <laughs> All right. Up next, we've got Health Talk Thanks, right here on KFAR. Have a great weekend.